Thank you, and I'd like to thank uh, Father JP for inviting me and the Tantor staff. And I'll also like to give a shout out for the St. George's College and Cathedral people who've come to support me and to listen and, and for all of you uh, here, here tonight. Uh, again, I'm Rodney Aist. I'm a, I'm a scholar of, of, of pilgrim, pilgrimage texts to Jerusalem before the Crusades, and so that's what we're gonna be looking at. Uh, this first slide really cover, these are drawings of churches uh, associated with one of the texts that we'll mention tonight, uh, but the one on the left is the Holy Sepulchre, the one on the right is the Church of the Ascension, and those are the beginning and starting points of the Jerusalem circuit, uh, which we'll talk about later. Uh, I do have a book coming out, it's, it's at the publisher now, uh, that uh, talks about the academic research behind it, but then sets it up as a walk that we can do ourselves. Uh, uh, with the route, uh, with a lot of information about the sites, with reflection questions. That book's not going to be out probably till next summer. Uh, so a lot of my talk now, rather than get into the details of the book, will be focusing on the academic uh, research uh, from these pilgrimage texts. Before I do that, okay, I, I would just like to talk a little bit about uh, the college. A lot of you will probably know St. George's Cathedral. You may have been there for, for a worship service. I'd like to just mention us as a college. We're really a, a, a pilgrimage uh, study center. Uh, we specialize in short-term programs. I know there's a lot of lo longer-term programs here in Jerusalem. Uh, when we're running, we're not running currently because of the situation, uh, we have open registration courses, uh, meaning that anybody anywhere in the world can sign up for our courses. Uh, we have ecumenical pilgrims, people from all different traditions. We get a lot of Catholics through as well. So, for instance, if you know of individuals who want to have a Jerusalem experience just on their own, I think of St. George's College in the future. Uh, you may or may not know our actual building, uh, but we're happy to, uh, to arrange a visit, either uh, myself or, or Dean Richards, who, who's here uh, in our uh, time. So uh, uh, be in touch. I said the book is not going to be out for a while, but this I'm very excited about the timing of this lecture because it helps allows me to introduce another event uh, that's related to one of the texts and one of the pilgrims that we're going to be talking about today. The pilgrim is, is Willibald. He was born in present-day England, and uh, he came to the Holy Land in the 8th century, and the 1300th anniversary of his arrival into Jerusalem is next month, uh, November the 11th. Uh, there will be a two-day event. Uh, the first day is uh, lectures and liturgies uh, at the Dormition Abbey, and then uh, the second day is uh, uh, walking and visiting some of his sites. So I, have, so I have some of the flyers if you want to come up and take a photo at the end in terms of the information. Uh, but this is just a little bit about what's happening those two days. Uh, it's sponsored by St. George's College and the Dormition Abbey. The reason Willibald, again, was Anglo-Saxon or English, uh, but he was also a Benedictine who, who became a bishop in Germany for 40 years. And so there's a nice partnership between St. George's College and the Dormition German Benedictine Abbey uh, for this uh, event. Here are some of the speakers who will be uh, on the Monday event. Uh, we've organized this so even in the current situation, the event will go on. Uh, we just have two, two speakers who are coming uh, from overseas. If for some reason they can't make it, then the, the program will just be, uh, be uh, consolidated uh, as such. So the time period that we're talking about in, in this presentation is pre-Crusader. Uh, so just kind of bullet point what some of these uh, uh, time periods are. Uh, we, we've got the Byzantine period, or early Islamic, and the Crusader. We will not be talking much about Crusader sources, uh, but a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to bridge the two periods uh, from the Byzantine period into the early Islamic period. And we might also be attentive to what happens at the very end of the Byzantine period. However, we might, might want to label that. But the Persian conquest, the Persians come in at, in 614. Uh, the Byzantines, so the Greek Christians, uh, reestablish their, their rule uh, about 15 years later. Uh, but that's short-lived uh, before the, uh, the Arabs come in. 
But just note that Byzantine restoration because there's a couple of monuments uh, that I'll be referring to that I, I would place being established or set up or constructed uh, during that brief period of Byzantine uh, restoration. What, what we're gonna be looking at are, are Jerusalem pilgrimage texts and just to kind of introduce you to, uh, to these texts, uh, it's a very loosely defined genre. Uh, and certainly, if you, t if you get into uh, crusader scholars, uh, there's a lot of debate about how you even do you refer to them as pilgrimage text, pilgrimage writing, pilgrimage literature. Uh, but what they consist of, they consist of different things. They can be impersonal guides, uh, like a pilgrim would actually have in his or her hand to, to walk the sites. Uh, they, are, of course, include either autobiographies written by a pilgrim after he, he's returned, uh, or a biography written by a, a man or a woman about another pilgrim. Interestingly, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, talking as well, some of these sources are written by remote authors, uh, meaning pe people who never ever saw Jerusalem. And so we can imagine and we'll look at what some of their images of Jerusalem, are, Jerusalem is by looking at other sources. These Writings, these pilgrimage texts come in all sorts of uh, forms. Uh, they are letters, uh, they are written biographies, autobiographies, they appear in saint lives, they appear in poetry. Uh, so again, the genre is, is quite diverse. So how do you use these texts and what, what's the research around this? Of course, they can be sources for the Jerusalem liturgy, for those familiar with the Egeria text, uh, that's a primary source for Jerusalem liturgy. Uh, they're also used, again, for just the history of an individual holy site, uh, of the, end of, uh, the history of a site. Uh, and a lot of these texts are just kind of, uh, they're just kind of mined for uh, small pieces of, of information. Uh, we can look at the text to, to see about pilgrim traditions. Uh, you know, what were the actions? How did they, uh, what did they do at a site? Uh, what did they think about a site? Uh, what are the stories that are being told to them by people uh, living here in Jerusalem? And then you might just imagine, because these are travel documents, uh, that there's just incidental information, there, there's anecdotes. Uh, but we could, in general, a Jerusalem pilgrimage text, sometimes it's an individual pilgrim that's, that's being followed, uh, but uh, uh, they somehow comprehensively describe the, topo the sacred topography of Jerusalem, but they talk about how to get here or back. So it's, it's more comprehensive uh, than just a, a brief reference to, the whole, to holy sites because they're by no means the only source for the holy sites. Uh, we get information about Jerusalem, about churches, about different places from uh, biblical commentaries, uh, from, from lectionaries, from other sources. And so when I talk about Jerusalem pilgrimage texts, these are texts that somehow are slightly comprehensive about talking about Jerusalem or actually tracing a particular uh, journey or travel. The one thing I would want to emphasize though, and I try to do you know, some in my, my research, even though you kind of take what you can get, is these texts just get picked over for individual pieces of information. It's nice to sit down with a text and appreciate the text for its entirety and read it as, as such. And so uh, th this is a list of, of, of most or the majority of the, of the sources that are before the Crusades. Uh, I really give you the list just so you know they exist. Uh, you may or may not recognize them, but you can kind of see the date either when they're written or when the Jerusalem you know, when the pilgrim was here, so it might relate to uh, the, the date of the, of the Jerusalem material. And if you don't take anything else out of the lecture or the presentation, then I would recommend in the next week or so that you would just find one of these texts and just read it through from beginning to end. Uh, they're only 15 pages at most. And the three that I've highlighted would be the three that I would recommend. And so uh, my email will appear on these slides more than once, so you can get in touch with me uh, for that. But where, where do you, would you find these texts? Certainly for English translations, and that's all I'll talk about. Uh, these texts are in various languages, Armenian, Greek, Latin, 
Let me just talk about uh, English. The Palestine Pilgrims Text Society, uh, which was active in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, translated these in English. All of those are online, uh, very easy to find in multiple places where these texts are. Uh, uh, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, John, John Wilkinson, who was also a, a dean at St. George's College where I work, he was also my uh, external uh, examiner for my PhD. Uh, he translated texts. Uh, most of those from that list are in, in this volume. Uh, just simply called Jerusalem Pilgrims Before the Crusades. Unfortunately, this is out of print, and it's kind of a minor publisher, so I will uh, quickly hide this book so it doesn't... Uh, Go, go, go missing, but uh, uh, it's a shame because some of these, his work is not as accessible as, as it should be. It really needs to be reprinted. And again, it depends on which text you're looking at. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, English uh, translations out as, as, as well. So when I talk in a few moments about the research of the Jerusalem circuit, uh, these are the four principal texts that we're going to look at. Uh, we'll look at the date and the characteristics of those texts in a few moments. But I want to just raise the question of what type of research can one do with pilgrimage texts? And some of them I've, I've laid out. So I want to spend a few moments before we get into the walking the Jerusalem circuit, actually going back to this question that, or this statement I said that there's a, some of these texts are written by uh, remote authors. And I'm, I'm going to refer to some other research uh, from, from a book that I published in 2009, I believe, uh, which looks at the image of Jerusalem in, in three of these texts uh, that you see uh, there. So let's break, let's break this down a, a little bit. So what, what I'm asking here, we're looking at, uh, uh, at remote authors so people who've never ever seen Jerusalem at all. And so they're looking at their written sources, they might have a pilgrim that they're talking to, and seeing what type of text uh, they come up with. Well, we have three interrelated texts. And so if you look at the diagram on the right, uh, the rectangular boxes are the three texts in, in question, ones from the fifth century, seventh century, early eighth century. If we start with Eucarius, the first text, uh, then he has some contemporary Jerusalem material, but he and all three of these are, uh, writers are, are simply using library resources, their own texts, to create this. So if we go to the second text, and in many ways this research is going to evolve, uh, be centered upon the Adivnon text, uh, written in Iona, Scotland, or probably was, the, he's from Iona, He's also using Eucarius. He's using his library in Iona, but now he also has an oral source, a pilgrim that uh, he met somehow in the, in the British Isles as well. And then Bede, who's from Northumbria, from, from England, uh, takes the Adivnon text and, and rewrites that. So I, I would like to look at their mental map and, and what they do is just one way of how these uh, uh, texts can be uh, interrogated for various research. So let's just ask a, a question before we jump in that. Be, a lot of us work, and was, uh, some of us here have just arrived into Jerusalem for the first time in the last three or four days. And so that idea of taking your image of Jerusalem and what you've had all your life through, through uh, reading the Bible and coming here and seeing how it changes when you see the actual stones, uh, the actual realities. Uh, those of us who work with pilgrims on a regular basis, we're constantly dealing with that type of phenomena of what, uh, what we had in our mind to what we see in the ground. And again, this is just a slightly different question of those who have never seen Jerusalem. Slightly different, of course, today because we have videos, we have photos, but imagine somebody in the, in the Middle Ages who have sources about Jerusalem, including the Bible, of course, uh, but have never, never been here. So one question, uh, if we're kind of creating the, the mental map, is what, uh, what's actually define, what, do, what construct, what do they use to actually define what's proper Jerusalem? 
Uh, what are the limits of Jerusalem? And I, I, give, I give you kind of the, the two answers here. One is either Jerusalem is defined by Mount Zion. And again, all of this we can even trace to some biblical resonance, some biblical sources. If we are thinking of, of Zion, the mountain city of Jerusalem, as that construct which defines Jerusalem, what shape might it be in our imagination? Round. It's a round, it's a round mountain. The other way of imagining what is proper Jerusalem would be by the course of the walls. And the course of the walls are going to be largely rectangular. Uh, they kind of run by the cardinal by the cardinal directions, or we might even say square if we look, look into uh, revelations. So I'm going I'm to show you some, uh, figures of these three texts uh, here, here in a second in terms of what their image of, of Jerusalem is. But if, they're, if we're constructing a textual map using a pilgrimage text, then the first thing is it's extremely important that we understand clearly the locations and sites and commemorations that are mentioned in the text. So the first thing of constructing the mental map is being accurate in terms of the topography that's mentioned in the, in the text. At the same time, you also have to be aware of what's in the text that's, that's missing, what, what's omitted, uh, what's distorted, uh, what are the errors, because we're looking at the mental map in the text, not what's on the ground. So, uh, so in order to do that, you really have to have kind of a comprehensive or a composite understanding of the topography of Jerusalem and how other pilgrimage texts work, uh, what, what they're saying to, to know what the omissions and what the errors are. So without going into too much detail, but it's very important in terms of looking at the text, in terms of reading the commemorative material. When I say commemorative material, then I, you know, the details that talk about the holy sites, uh, that talk about the churches, that talk about the religious landscapes, uh, then there's usually four things to think about when you read the descriptions about the Holy Sepulchre or about the church in Gethsemane or, or ascension of other places. First of all is, is commemoration. Uh, what is being remembered? You know, what biblical event took place? Uh, how clear is that? You know, what is, is being remembered? And sometimes it's not even a biblical event. Sometimes it's more of a, a theological idea, like the center of the world or something. But what's the memory? What's the dedication? The second thing in the text, of course, is, is where is it located? Uh, you know, what's the description? How far away is it from something? Uh, uh, the appearance of the site? Uh, does it, is, is there a description of the church, of the monument, of, of the columns? And then the, the, the sequence in terms of... Uh, uh, where it appears in, in the text. And so uh, that's a, a methodology that I won't go into more detail, but what, what I want to just say is when we're looking at these pilgrim texts, uh, it, it, we're just not randomly deciding wh where something is, but there, there is a, a, a system or a structure or methodology uh, to be able to, to look at one particular text or even better to compare uh, texts uh, to text. Uh, and the last thing on this slide, when I show you the image of these three, three different texts, is to, to know that the image I present to you, the map, uh, is, is not the actual mental map. Let me say that a little differently. The, uh, the mental map is still textual. So when we try to pull out a map from the text and we create that on paper, too often that becomes uh, almost too dominant in terms of reading the text. But the, the, the image that I'm going to show you is not, not the mental map. The mental map is still contained within the words of the text itself. I hope it's a subtle point, but uh, can be very important. The, the analogy would be is the way that when you have maps and Bibles, you know, at the back of a Bible, how that then determines how somebody reads the text. So just, just hold, hold that point. I want to make two points about pilgrim interaction with Jerusalem or with the Holy Land uh, that's important for understanding their experience, 
but also ways that we can learn or critique past pilgrims in terms of the ways uh, that we interact with the city today. And these are things that I uh, think about when I, when I lead pilgrims as well. The first one is, is that traditionally Christian pilgrims over the centuries did not come to Jerusalem to revivify the biblical past or merely to do that. Another way to state that more positively is Christian pilgrims were always interested in the Jerusalem of their day. And there's some very basic the theological reasons for that. If God was the God of the Old Testament, if God's providence is always active, if God is God, you know, God of the universe, then the, the God of the biblical past, we, the pilgrims would still expect to see that when they're coming in the, in the Middle Ages. So they're still see, looking for signs of God in the, in the holy sites. Uh, and I might contrast that to pil some pilgrims today who come to Jerusalem in the 21st century and they're really trying to escape and just look back into the biblical past. But there's always attention to the, the status of the sites, you know, and that is in some ways going to uh, let us know about um, uh, the providence of God. On the other hand, uh, even though they were interested in Jerusalem of their time, they were not necessarily interested in, in the religious other. Uh, occasionally in Christian texts, you have mention of the Jews or the Muslims, but not much. It's not, not part of their in interest. And Jerome Murphy O'Connor, uh, in one of his uh, articles even, uh, says, as I write there, you know, Jewish sources mention Jews, Christian sources mention Christians, and Muslim sources mention a Muslim. So I think the first point is something we can learn from. And so what that means when I lead pilgrims is not only am I thinking about the archeology span or trying to set the biblical setting, but the way a site presents itself today in terms of its con contemporary art or in terms of the sculptures there, in terms of the scriptures, whatever you see at the site is a part of that contemporary experience of seeing Jerusalem in our own time. Uh, but I think we can critique uh, past pilgrim tradition here to say that uh, we should be interested in the religious other in terms of understanding things in an ecumenical and uh, in interfaith way. So let's get, let's get into one of these texts. Uh, again, we're going to, uh, it's a remote author, and we're going to try to quickly build a, a mental map, and I'm going to be giving you more findings here rather than go through all of the arguments, but to uh, the restate the point, part of it is to see what do these texts produce in terms of things you can work with. So this is the Eucharist text from the fifth century, and he's describing Jerusalem. He describes it as a site on a natural height, and from every direction those who approach it certainly have a climb. The scent is long, but it's gentle. The site of the city is almost forced into a circular shape and is enclosed by a lengthy wall, which now embraces Mount Zion, though this once was just outside. It is on the south and overlooks the city like a citadel. The greater part of the city lies on the flat top of the hill, which is lower than this mount, and talks about three important uh, uh, gates. So if we just look at that image, he talks about almost the Jerusalem as a conical mountain. It's certainly circular. And even though he talks about walls, they're either nondescript or we would assume that they, they follow the line of that. And there's other things in, in the text, but if we're looking at Eucharist' image of Jerusalem, what we get is, is a round circle uh, that's like that, the mountain. He does talk about the, the, the three gates. Uh, but what's interesting about Eucharist is his construct, his, what orients him to describing Jerusalem is Mount Zion. Now that's going to be the western hill but Mount Zion. So uh, he focuses on Mount Zion. It's, it's a round circle. Uh, we're, go we're not gonna worry too much about the Mount of Olives right now, but his image of intramural Jerusalem again is, is round. We could ask uh, Mount Zion is completely within the walls. Uh, we can ask questions like, uh, does Holy Zion, this conical mountain, extend all the way down to the temple? So is, is, is the temple part of Mount, Mount Zion? Same thing we can ask that about uh, the Holy, Holy Sepulchre. And there is one uh, d d uh, 
distortion in, in this type of image. And we know because it even talks about rain that falls on Mount Zion that goes outside of the East Gate, which is incorrect, is uh, certainly Jerusalem consists of an eastern and western hill with a valley in the middle. And so that's not taken in, into account. So uh, let's just hold that and move to the next text, uh, which is the uh, Adonan of, of Iona. Uh, so just to bullet point a couple things of interest uh, in this text, it's the most detailed of all Christian pilgrimage texts from the uh, early Islamic period. It does supplement uh, library written sources in Iona uh, with an eyewitness account of a contemporary pilgrim which Adavnan somehow uh, finds. It can, uh, and that's been a big part of, of scholarship in, in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, for a long time, you know, going back 100 years ago, this text was exclusively thought of in terms of the pilgrim whose, whose name is Arkaf. Uh, some of the scholarship, especially my PhD advisor, Thomas O'Loughlin, uh, kind of uh, leaned the other way and began really focusing on the written, written sources of, of, of Iona, but it's a mix between the, the two. Uh, it's the earliest source uh, anywhere of any language, of any faith background that mentions a uh, Muslim house of prayer on the former Temple Mount or the, or the Haram. I'll show you that excerpt in just a second. And it also includes in the text, in a number of the uh, manuscripts, uh, some drawings of Jerusalem churches, Ascension, Holy Sepulcher, and Mount and Holy Zion, and also uh, Jacob's Well up in uh, the Nablus. Uh, this little treatise uh, was really kind of a medieval bestseller. I mean, there's lots of manuscripts, and it was very, uh, very popular. But let's just get into a couple things of this text. This is really just for your own information. Since I raised the point, you're probably curious about what it actually says about uh, the, the house of prayer. You could probably read that yourselves. Uh, but it talks about uh, near the city wall on the east, uh, in the place where the temple once stood, uh, they're referring to the Muslims, the Saracens, built an oblong house of prayer uh, made of planks and large beams, and it can hold up to 3,000 3, people. Okay, so that, that's just for uh, your interest. Uh, again, we're, we want to look in a second here at what the mental map of this text is, knowing that this text is already is using the Eucharist text as one of its sources. And so out of non is is uh, interviewing Arkaf uh, about the houses, about the buildings inside of Jerusalem, but basically he says, yes, there's a bunch of magnificent, well-built uh, houses, but I don't want to tell you about any of them. I just want to tell you about the, uh, uh, the mag amazing buildings uh, at the place of the resurrection and uh, the cross. And so, uh, so two things here. If we use this as kind of a hint, we're gonna get into the text and realize the only thing that out of non includes of the intramural Jerusalem is the Holy Sepulchre, nothing else. He's, he's hinted right here. And the other thing is we're going to expect that he's left, left, left some things out, okay? Now one thing of reading the text and one reason why the mental map that I'm gonna show you, I think in two slides, uh, hadn't been detected in the, in the ways that I'm gonna present is because of this reference to a very large column, which it's in the middle of the city. One thing that I think is a bit deceptive, it says it's north of the holy places. And there's two commemorations associated with a column. One, it's part of the legend of the um, uh, finding of the Holy Cross, uh, where Helena finds three crosses uh, but you have to figure out which one is Jesus. So they, uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's a dead young man and he came, comes to life, but it also marks uh, the center of, of the world. Now, uh, previous scholars have incorrectly identified this column and actually some other, a number of columns uh, with the black column uh, next to the North Gate, which is the Damascus Gate. Can you see that all fine? But it's actually, 
it's actually about right there on, on the, that part of the Holy Sepulchre. And I can show that to you three, four, five different ways by using the methodology that I mentioned. And again, don't have time to go through that. But I just want to get to the image that he presents. And that is Adavnon's mental map of Jerusalem. So again, uh, uh, it, it's a square. There's three, three primary gates. And the only site he describes is the Holy Sepulchre. Now, in the Holy Sepulchre, there's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of commemorations and legends and relics, but it's all uh, within the Holy Sepulchre. We might just take his simple image, and that's the Byzantine map of Jerusalem. So uh, it gives us some idea of, you know, the, the Holy Sepulchre is, is right here. Um, this is, what, this is what Wilkinson does in the book of his translation of Arkuf. And you might see how, and I'm, I'm gonna, l l let's go through uh, some, of, some of the issues here. Oops. Again, um, oops. Scholars have identified that column with, with, the, with the north gate uh, uh, right there. I think, I think it might just be easier if I go to this next slide here. Okay, how do we get to this image? We get to this image because uh, all of the intramural content is limited to the Holy Sepulcher. And this includes the column that I mentioned. He does it by admitting the Pool of Bethesda. He clearly knows that the Pool of Bethesda exists, uh, but he admits it. And he also admits uh, Holy Zion. Uh, so Holy Zion is inside the walls. He places it outside the walls. And then he's able to find uh, Jerusalem uh, by, uh, by its, by its four, four walls. So, so what we have here is a remote author in Scotland who's taking some real topography and, and, and re reports from Jerusalem, uh, but he's manipulating it in different ways by leaving out the Pool of Bethesda, uh, putting the Holy Zion outside the walls, only talking about things related to uh, the Holy, Holy Sepulcher. And we, 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 we did have the temple here. But the reference to the temple takes place in the very first chapter after he's already established that the city is the city of Christ by another story. And if I, I believe if we properly read what he's doing with the temple, with the Saracens there, is it's past prologue. It's no longer there. Jews are no longer even praying there. Uh, another group of people there. And once we go f and just remove the temple as well, and then we have this image, which is effectively a four-square city reminiscent of New Jerusalem uh, from Revelation. And I would even argue that the Holy Sepulchre then functions as, as the Lamb of God. So you've got the, uh, what I think is a very sophisticated theological image uh, that's dealing with the, with the real topography of, of Jerusalem. Uh, to go through the couple of these very, very quickly then, even though Adavnon has this other text, uh, you can see how he, how he changes that. And to get into the, the third of these three texts, which is Bede, and there's more than I could, more I could say about this. Bede then uh, has not been studied much because he, he offers nothing new. He's only using other texts. He has both of these texts here. Uh, and, and this is what, what he, he, he ends up doing. Um, you can tell... His is much more busy than, than Adavnon's, and he really deconstructs uh, this image of the four square city. He goes back to the idea of, of Zion, uh, Zion uh, being, uh, being round. So I know there's a lot missing there. It, it, it's in this book from 2009, uh, from topography to text. Uh, but I wanted just to say that there's things you can do with this tech, these texts 
uh, that have to do with uh, religious imagination, has to do with mental maps, and we can see how remote writers either use, uh, and we, we can ask ourselves that to, today how we define uh, Jerusalem. Do we define Jerusalem by Zion, by, by natural features, or do we define Jerusalem uh, by the walls? But let, let's move, uh, as we want to, back into uh, uh, the Jerusalem circuit, and we're moving from remote auth writers to actual Jerusalem pilgrims. And that's going to be more exciting in a way, because instead of using our minds, we can now walk, this, walk in the footsteps of, of these same pilgrims. Uh, and here we're going to get firsthand descriptions of, of Jerusalem and, and, and the holy site. So what we're going to focus on now is the, is the Jerusalem circuit or the, or the sequence in which the pilgrims walked, walked the sites. And that's our, our main, main topic for the rest, rest of the lecture. Now, there has been previous scholarship before we get into this on the Jerusalem circuit. Uh, John Wilkinson, who I've already mentioned, uh, he, he wrote a, an article in 1976 where by the end of the Byzantine period, he's basically saying, well, this is the route the pilgrims are walking. Uh, I follow up on his and move it into the early Islamic period and kind of fill out a little, little bit more of uh, the dynamics that we're going to get, get into. And I will say that uh, the, the term Jerusalem circuit comes from Willibald. Uh, sometimes circuit might imply literally a circle. Uh, we're, we're just talking about the, uh, the route, often their, their one-way uh, directions that he's going. I'm just going to quickly go through what some of the earlier texts do in terms of the sequencing, and then we're going to get to what the uh, uh, Jerusalem circuit becomes. Uh, this is a, one of these impersonal texts that, you can, that pilgrims would walk, and then there are just some later versions of it. And uh, uh, hopefully we can kind of interpret for ourselves the, the, the map of Jerusalem there without too much detail, but you're always going to see this kind of one-two connection between the Holy Sepulchre and Zion. Holy Sepulchre, Holy Zion. Uh, the third church, which is, we'll talk about, is a church which called Holy, Holy Wisdom or Hagia Sophia, which remembers during the Byzantine period Jesus' trial before Pilate. Okay, there's more I can say about that. We'll talk a little bit more, but I just want to see the variations in what some of the texts are doing in terms of their, their, their movement and order through Jerusalem. Now we might take uh, earlier two sixth century texts. Uh, this is Theodosius and he actually gives kind of multiple itineraries through Jerusalem. Again, you got the one, two, three of Holy Sepulchre, Holy Zion, Holy Wisdom, and kind of going in different uh, directions. But you notice in these texts, there, there's a tension to the right, to the south side of the Temple Mount, uh, even a tension to, to the Pool of Siloam. Even in Theodosius, you've got uh, a tension uh, to, to that side. And so now uh, let's get into the four principal texts that are going to really kind of codify what's going to become uh, uh, the, the standardized circuit, or at least for this period. So we're going to look at four different texts. And what's interesting about that is we've got represented three different languages over three different centuries. Uh, it also expands two very different time periods, late Byzantine into the early Islamic period. Uh, there's a difference between the authors. Some of these pilgrims are, are, are you know, international pilgrims coming in. So Phronius actually later becomes the patriarch of, of Jerusalem. So he's somebody writing as, as somebody who lives in Jerusalem. So you have this difference between a resident versus a pilgrim. Uh, and you have different types of, of uh, texts here. And the Armenian guide is an impersonal guide uh, where some of these are more traditional. Uh, Sophronius is a poem. And, and some of these are pilgrimage guides. So you have a, a broad selection of texts, different, different languages, uh, different genres, who will, uh, in a second, I'll, I'll show you the, their circuit. So this goes back to the timeline, just puts those four uh, texts in, uh, and you can see how they're bridging 
uh, this kind of moving from Christian rule into Islamic rule. And then uh, we got a lot more to go, but basically the lecture can be summed up, I hope, in just this slide, and you're gonna go, ha. Ah. So this is these four texts, and the arrows are, n are not the pathways, uh, but it's pointing to the, to the sequence of, of the sites. And hopefully you, you got the Sophronius, Armenian, Willibald, and Bernard, and we've got the movement from Zion, uh, and the Holy, Zion, the Holy Wisdom Church number three gets destroyed in the, at the end of the Byzantine period, but they're still going through that same direction uh, to the Pool of Bethesda, now St. Anne's, down into the Gethsemane sites, and up to uh, the Mount of Olives to Ascension. Now I'm just going to uh, compare that route to a couple of other visual sources. Uh, that's still a late Byzantine map there. Just focus on that, but I'm gonna turn it around and, and put it next to that. So you got from the, from the Holy Sepulcher to Holy Zion here, back through the city. Uh, Holy Wisdom's not on this map because this map is, only has archeological finds on it. We know where Holy Wisdom was because of texts, uh, but we haven't found it archeologically, so it's not on that map. And then uh, Bethesda. So then let's go uh, to the Madaba map. So the Madaba map becomes extremely interesting source in terms of walking the Jerusalem circuit. I might, quick, I might quickly say it's not evidence of this standardized route, uh, but once we see what the route is, it's very easy to put it on there. And namely, you, you've got the walk from the Holy Sepulcher down the Western Cardo to Holy Zion, finding your way down the hill uh, to the Eastern Cardo and, and out. So there, there's lots of, uh, uh, so you're essentially walking uh, the, the Jerusalem circuit as well. So if we put, put that to, I hope you can match that up visually of, of, Holy, of Holy Sepulcher, and it's using the, the main cardos at least inside, inside the this, this city. Okay, I'm going to skip a couple things and get right into, I had a couple of, uh, of quotes of how pilgrims enter from, from, from the north, and that certainly interests us that live in uh, uh, St. George's College because we enter from the north all the time. But let me uh, just now bullet point the arguments and kind of the fill out uh, the evidence and premises of the Jerusalem circuit. So I showed you with those four texts really the evidence. So I wanna be clear that there's no time in any of these texts is there a description that there is a standardized circuit that pilgrims are all walking. The evidence are these collection of texts over three centuries written in different languages uh, in different forms. That alone is the evidence. Uh, and they are describing the same route in walking terms as, as we would expect. And it's, you know, and it does, when we put it back to the Madaba map, the order is very logical. It's following the main streets, uh, intramural streets of, of Jerusalem. Print's a little bit smaller here, uh, but you would say that the function of the circuit is simply to link the primary sites of a holy city together in, in one go. You know, how, you know, one way to get the primary sites uh, together. And so what emerges, this is what Wilkinson would say in his article, what emerges by the, the late Byzantine period is again, you begin at the Holy Sepulcher, you go to Holy Zion, then you're gonna find your way down to Gethsemane, and then you're gonna end up on the top of the Mount of Olives. Now, once, once you've decided, if you can follow this, to go from Holy Zion to Gethsemane, then it forces a decision, and namely, which way are you gonna take around uh, the Temple Mount? The, uh, okay. You saw some of those earlier texts where we're going south, a little bit of curiosity there. And then when we uh, came, you know, come to, the, to these, they're decidedly not going that way, but back, back through the city. So 
So as the, as the circuit develops, it chose, it chose the, the option that I just mentioned, which had easier pathways and the more significant sites, which in the visiting period was this church remembering Jesus at Pilate, uh, the pool of Bethesda, and then exiting uh, out the eastern, eastern gate. Another thing then to surmise uh, from this circuit, and I do think it plays out in the text, is that the, pl the places not on the circuit then become second, second tier sites. They're still visited, but they're just simply not on the circuit, and that would have to do with uh, certainly Al-Qadama and, and the pool of uh, Siloam as two. Uh, we can say that the, the route itself was more set than the list of stations. Uh, what does that mean? We can, we can think of at least one station, uh, the church of, of, Pi, of Jesus' trial at Pilate being destroyed and abandoned and never rebuilt, uh, and at least one monument was added uh, over the years. Uh, and just a couple of other points here. You know, no one text is just going to list every site or every commemoration that we can collectively put together from all the sites, from all the texts. And then uh, as we've looked at some of those other pilgrim, pilgrimage texts, not every text is going to be organized according to the, to the, to the Jerusalem circuit. Okay. Now, I think this is still logical, but this is a little bit more speculative, that I, I, I believe the circuit was supported by the Jerusalem church, and what would, what would we mean by that? Well, I think we can think in terms of language-specific or multilingual tours organized, perhaps by the resident monks in Jerusalem, uh, and, and, and a, a, a occurring f uh, fairly often, fairly frequently, uh, mul perhaps multiple times per, per week, you know, meet at the Holy Sepulchre, uh, and then going together as a group. Uh, pilgrims probably individually went, went on their own as, as well. And I believe, you know, if pilgrims were staying in Jerusalem uh, nine, nine months or several months, I believe this is an activity that they're doing over and over and over. Now, we can compare that to pilgrims that we have today who are here 10, you know, 10, 10 days, 14 days. They see sites once. Uh, pilgrims are doing this over and over and over. It was certainly a devotional practice full, full of prayer, uh, spirituality, uh, but it's very different than the stational liturgy or the uh, liturgical calendar, which is focusing on uh, particular feast days or particular uh, liturgies during that. So in, just to wrap up these initial points, and then we'll get into the more into the circuit. Uh, the circuit was a formative experience of, uh, for pilgrims. This is how they experienced the sites. This is how they walked the sites. Uh, this is how they remembered the sites when they wrote some of their texts. Uh, and as we, uh, and whether or not you buy everything I just said, at the very least, uh, we can walk in, in the footsteps of the, of the four-step text that I mentioned. We can walk in the footsteps of Sophronius, Willibald, and, and Ber uh, Bernard. So what I want to do is use the Sophronius text uh, to kind of create the circuit in more detail, and then we'll look at, at the other texts. So Sophronius was a long-term resident. Uh, this, is a, this is poetry that, that he writes. He, he might have written it when he was absent from, from Jerusalem, kind of longing for Jerusalem. Uh, and the, the, the commemorations uh, would date before uh, the Persian conquest of, four, of uh, 614. So I wanted to give you just a little bit of a taste of the text uh, without getting too specific into uh, uh, the individual sites. But again, this will, this will uh, deal with the, the tomb of Christ and the Holy Sepulchre. A lot of this we can read ourselves, but you know, let, let, let me walk to the Holy Sepulchre uh, where the king of all rose again, trampling down the power of death. I just want you to be familiar with the wording of one text. Uh, through the divine sanctuary, I will penetrate the divine tomb and with deep reverence will venerate uh, that rock. So that's, holy, that's the tomb of Christ, still in the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, then let me pass on to the, to the uh, place of the skull. Uh, prostrate, I will uh, venerate the navel point or the center of, of the world uh, uh, where the cross was fixed, uh, which undid the curse of the tree. Uh, again, you, you can continue to read that, but the description of, of Gagotha or the place of the crucifixion. 
Uh, then he moves on to talk about the place where the Holy Cross was found, uh, where, he vener uh, where people go to venerate the cross, uh, where, where Empress Helena, mother of Constantine, found the divine wood. I want to make just a, a quick uh, a scholarly aside here. It might be something we, we talk about later. Uh, but the most recent, uh, we, we, many of us will know about the legend of Helena finding the, 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 the crosses. The most recent biography on Helena, uh, which was written uh, by a scholar in Bonn, Germany, just came out last year, uh, dates Helena's arrival in, Ger in Jerusalem to early 328, when the Holy Sepulchre was already in a state of being built, uh, which, uh, and we could talk more about that. So there is a legend of her, of her finding the Holy Cross. Uh, you know, that's not mentioned in sources till later. That might be something we want to talk about. I just want to, let me just bring that to your attention. And that might, uh, that s scholars are now dating her uh, entrance to Jerusalem a little bit later. Uh, and this is probably the, the best uh, diagram of the Byzantine church that we have uh, with, the, uh, with the tomb, uh, Calvary. And I would say in the Byzantine period, the location of the finding of the Holy Cross, that third one, was in the apse of the, of the Basilica Church. And if you're seeing that for the first time, it might be a little uh, confusing, but let, let's, let's move on just to get through some of the, uh, uh, the text. This is Sophronius uh, talking about uh, Holy Zion, and maybe you can just read that as, as I talk. Uh, but there's going to be three commemorations in particular at Holy Zion. It's going to be Pentecost, uh, the Last Supper, and, and the death of Mary. So we have uh, the Last Supper and the washing of the feet. Uh, we have Mary's death. And then we have uh, resurrection appearances and uh, P Pentecost at top. Uh, this goes back to that diagram in the Adamnon text of Holy Zion. Again, those are the typical commemorations at Holy Zion. Back to the church that remembers uh, Jesus uh, before Pilate. And so there's a reference to the house of Pilate, but also a, a stone or a column uh, where Jesus was scourged. Um, this is another reference to the same site, just to give you more familiarity with it. Um, but I think I'm going I'm 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 to I'm I'm skip, skip this quickly, but it's the Basilica of Holy Wisdom, Holy Zion, or also Holy St. Sophia. It also talks about the uh, Jesus' footprints being there where he was uh, uh, scourged on a column. We can go back to the, to the Madaba map. Uh, ho Holy Wisdom is certainly on the map. I would say it's probably there, uh, but we know it was one of the top four churches in, in Jerusalem and would, would certainly be on, on that map. For Father Dave at the Bethesda, St. Anne's, uh, here's the description from Sophronius of uh, Bethesda, which includes the, the birth of Mary. And so there's two commemorations up there, the birth of Mary, uh, then the paralytic healing. Again, just language from Sophronius, the, the poetry, this longing for Jerusalem. And descending down into Gethsemane, so we're at number five over on the other side, and talk about where she dies in Holy Zion, and then she's laid to rest uh, in Gethsemane. What's missing, though, are references to the Jesus sites at Gethsemane. So there's no reference to uh, the betrayal uh, or, or the prayer or, or of agony. And Sophronius then has some wonderful language at the very top of the Mount of Olives, talking about the Mount of Olives where Jesus ascended. And then he goes to, to a nearby church, which is now the Paternoster Church, originally the Eleona, which was uh, not the Last Supper, oh, sorry, not the Lord's Prayer Church, but where Jesus taught about the end of time or these divine mysteries. 
And then I just love this about uh, he, he's now walked all the way up to, Jerusalem, to Mount of Olives. He's looking back into Jerusalem. And as he's, uh, he's coming out of the doors of what would be the Pater Noster Church or the Iliona, and he's looking over the holy city, how sweet it is to see thy fair beauty, city of God from the Mount of Olives. So there's, there's some nice uh, sentiment in, into this text. And I think I'll just wrap up here with the other, other couple of texts. So we've kind of built the, the circuit using one text. Uh, we can now use the other uh, Armenian guide. It's the same route as George Sophronius, but some different stations. Uh, these are the stations not included, uh, but there's one new commemoration. Like I said, uh, once the route is established, then there could be new commemorations. And uh, uh, what is on is number th it's number three on on the on on this. Let me, let me just tell you about it. It's, it refers to the funeral procession of Mary. So Mary dies in Holy Zion. Her body is taken to Gethsemane. And on the way, according to the legend, uh, a group, a single Jew or a group of Jews tries to steal her body. Uh, when that happens, their hands are frozen to the funeral bed. An angel of the Lord appears, cuts off the hands, and the Jew or the group of Jews repents, and they're healed. And uh, there's a monument right outside the East Gate uh, that remembers this exact event. And we, we won't go over them, but there's three texts uh, that, that, that talk about this, and uh, including the Willibald text, which is one of the, one of the, of the circuits. And so if you look at uh, Dormition icons, uh, you often see this uh, angel of the Lord and the person trying to steal Mary's body there. But uh, kind of surprisingly, uh, you know, in the early Islamic period, you have a monument just outside the East Gate uh, to, the, to that event. And I'm going to argue uh, that that's put up during the Byzantine Restoration uh, because it also, for a few different arguments, links up with this other column of the miraculous healing that I've mentioned earlier. And I just don't have time to go over all of the parallel similarities to that. Uh, but I think both of those columns, which are described in the same uh, design as looking the same, they appear in the text at the same time, I think are, are a part of that. Okay. Uh, Willibald, let's, let's talk about Willibald briefly because it's, it's an important source for the Jerusalem circuit. Uh, just a bit about the text. He's here in the 720s, but he dictates the, his travels when, when he's an elderly bishop in, in seven, when he's 78 years old to a female relative named Hugo Brooks. So the text is written by a woman. Uh, what's, it, what's interesting is every single site in the text is on the Jerusalem circuit. Uh, to say that in another way, there are no sites in the text that are not on the circuit. Uh, this suggests uh, that Willibald probably walked that over and over and over, and that the circuit was this, uh, whether or not he used notes or not, I don't know that he had any notes. This, become, this template becomes the entire template of his description of Jerusalem. So then when we talk about how important the circuit is for pilgrim experience, uh, we can see that the entire text written 50 years after he was in Jerusalem, uh, follows, uh, follows the circuit. Other interesting thing about Willibald, he's the first Latin pilgrim in Jerusalem after the Dome of the Rock was built, doesn't mention it, which goes back to the previous uh, thing uh, that, that I mentioned. The last text is Bernard, uh, really really the, 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 same, the, the same things. Uh, two things are interesting when, when he's walking around here, he, he does refer to some things you can see, but it's as if he's still on the route. It's a different language, it's different directions. He's still following the route, but he does include some other information. And when I said how the Pool of Siloam, Siloam becomes a secondary site, this is his description of Jerusalem. He goes to 
Bethany and Bethesda comes back to Jerusalem, and that's the first time he mentions the Pool of Siloam. So I think there's these little clues that you can get in the, in, in, in the text uh, that talk about how the, the circuit's the circuit. There's still other sites. You still eventually see those, but something's happening here uh, that, that's, that's very, uh, very standardized. And just, just to, to kind of to fini finish with this, um, there is a movement throughout this whole circuit. You know, it's not liturgical. There's not a central theme. You're just getting all the principal sites, but you are moving from resurrection to, to ascension. And certainly in the early, uh, 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 early Islamic period with these texts by Willowbald, by, uh, by Adivnan, uh, the ascension site is, is, is the, the, the second most, um, in terms of the religious imagination and the affinity of pilgrims and their attachment to a site, uh, ascension is now uh, clearly the second site and it, it grabs people's attention a little bit more than, than, the, whole, uh, than the Holy Zion site. So I'll wrap up, I'll wrap up now in, in two minutes. Uh, my book's not coming out for nine months, so there's not reason to talk too much about it. Uh, but I do go over the academic arguments. Uh, the, the, what happens in the Crusader period is the Crusaders do have a presence or an interest in the Temple Mount, in the Haram Sharif, and that just, that just changes pilgrim movements. And so we can, at that point, uh, because of that alone, just see that this circuit is not being walked or followed in the same way. Uh, I've, I talk about the status quo, uh, there's practicalities, you know, uh, for walk, walking the circuit today would be, you know, kind of uh, for people like us who live here. This is not really ideal for somebody who's only in Jerusalem for seven or ten days. But when we know Jerusalem really well, I think it can be just another nice way to do it. The, the circuit itself is four kilometers. Just to walk it alone takes one hour. Uh, what I've done in the book, uh, these are the stations I've included, five at the Holy Sepulchre, including some we didn't talk about, the Holy Zion, uh, which is both now the Cynical and the Dormition Abbey. I do in, in, include the uh, Jephonius Monu Monument. Now, two of these sites are now destroyed. Uh, I've just put that at the, at the Western Wall Plaza because it's more or less the area. And I've put this at the, at the Muslim Cemetery when, when you come outside of Lion's Gate because it's mostly there. And we can do this as, as the very last, uh, last, uh, last slide. So the book, once you have the book, it, it has pilgrim texts that relate to the site, it has scriptures related to the site, it has two or three, four pages that just describe the site, its history, its, its archaeology, but also the contemporary things that you see there, there today. But I also, just in a small way, even though it's, it is Christian Jerusalem and you are in the footsteps of other Christian pilgrims, I think it can be kind of a, a contemporary prayer walk of being uh, sensitive, open to what uh, Jerusalem is. Now it's, you know, there's, there's limits to that. But if you take just the stations uh, that are listed historically in, in the book, uh, then this is what we'll, we'll end with. There's four, four status quo sites that you're going to go to. There's sites used by six different Christian churches, four different Catholic communities. There's two of the three original Constantinian uh, churches. The other one is in, in Bethlehem, so a Holy Sepulcher and the one on the Mount of Olives. You have two sites that are French national property. You have an Antonio Berluzzi church. You have four sites that have, have had a Muslim presence uh, one way or the other, not including the Holy Sepulchre, which Muslims have the keys to it. Uh, one site uh, in the administrative possession of the Israeli Ministry of Interior. Uh, two sites, like I said, that are no longer extant. So you kind of ask yourself, what is it like to remember something that's no longer there? Uh, but you know, it's balanced between the location where you're gonna remember it. One's a Jewish location, one's a, uh, with, with uh, a Muslim prehistory as, as well. And then uh, you're just passing through all sorts of, of stuff. So I went over my time a little bit. So apologies for that, JP, but uh, uh, that, that's, that's where we end.